they have a count of how many people are there on youtube when we start yeah, yeah everything everything youtube also uh, keeps a record huh? uh, i will take a yeah, screenshot so, for you uh, no problem yeah, so what, what you know, if, if you can tell me at the time when we start you know at at, at uh, six o'clock your time how many people are there on youtube if you can just give me that yeah, uh, number yeah yeah remember we are live now so people can hear on youtube now okay
Hello and namaste to everyone. Uh, welcome to the online training for uh, Pressure Vessels 101. My name is Ramesh Tiwari. I will be your instructor today. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank each and every one of you for uh, registering for this course. Also, there is a lot of activities that go on behind the scenes to put together a training such as this. I would like to take this opportunity to recognize my friends at Indian Biogas Association for making this training possible. This is a very impressive group. We have people in excess of 1,000 who are registered for this training. And we have a lot to cover. So let us start with a safety moment and get right to the training. Okay, so um, right, So many countries are now starting to reopen their economies after the coronavirus pandemic. However, we are not out of the woods yet. So it behooves us to observe all the common sense precautions. And what are those? Those common, common sense precautions are that we should maintain social distance of six feet from other people. We should wash our hands frequently whenever you are, whenever you enter home or at regular intervals when you are outside. You should continue holding online meetings if possible. And equally important, you should monitor your health continuously. So what are we going to achieve via this training today? First, I'm going to tell you what we will not achieve. If you are new to the subject of pressure vessels, this training will not make you an expert. No one hour training anywhere will be able to do that. What this training will provide is an introduction to ASME bother and pressure vessel code. This is the code of choice for most users worldwide. This training will also demonstrate to you how a simple pressure vessel can be designed. And we will go through an example towards the end of the training to demonstrate that. And most importantly, the training will hopefully instill in you, if you are new to the pressure vessels, a desire to learn more about the ecosystem surrounding pressure vessels. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by the ecosystem surrounding the pressure vessels? It means that the what I mean by that is that ASME Bother and Pressure Vessel Code is a construction code. If the, the post-construction activities are covered by codes and standards which are outside of ASME Bother and Pressure Vessel Code, and therefore you should be familiar with those codes also. So what is the definition of pressure vessel? ASME Code defines pressure vessels thus. It says, Pressure vessels are containers for containment of pressure, either internal or external. So immediately one of the questions that comes to mind is whether there is a minimum and maximum limit to the pressure that code imposes. The answer to that is not very clear. So as we, uh, we will see later in the slides, it's not very straightforward. So now that we have the definition of the pressure vessels, are there any generic types that pressure vessels can be grouped into? Yes, we can group pressure vessels into three different types, storage vessels, heat exchangers, and process vessels. We shall see an example of each in the next few slides. The first type is a storage vessel, which as the name suggests, is used to store fluids. Depending on the pressure, the storage vessel can be either cylindrical in shape for moderate pressure, or it can be spherical in shape, as is shown in this, in this slide, for high pressures. The second type of, of pressure vessels is a heat exchanger. These are used for heating or cooling the, the process fluid at, various, at varying pressures. Shown here is a shell and tube heat exchanger, which, while not being the most efficient type, it definitely is the most versatile a versatile type of heat exchanger in use today, and it is the workhorse of the industry. The third type of 
pressure vessel is a process vessel of which distillation column that's shown on the screen now is a very good example. I also wanted to show you the equipment which are typically used in a process plant. This slide shows pressure vessels that are used in a typical ethylene plant. Here, the classification of pressure vessels that I have used for the purposes of this presentation is drums, towers, reactors, dryers, and chalentive heat exchangers. These are all built to ASME boiler and pressure vessel core. There are other equipment in the uh, ethylene plant, which uh, all which include air cool heat exchangers, plate fin heat exchangers plate and frame heat exchangers, etc. These are also pressurized equipment, and therefore they can be defined as pressure vessels. However, the ASME code doesn't directly and fully apply to them. So at least for the purposes of this presentation, I have not included them in the count. You will also find in a typical plant, tanks, furnaces, compressors, pumps, fans, blowers, turbines, etc. As you can see on this slide, the pressure vessels make up almost 40% of all the equipment that is used in an ethylene process plant. When it comes to design of any equipment, mechanical engineers usually look to some kind of applicable codes and standards. The applicable code for the pressure vessel is the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code. This code is actually a collection of a number of different sections, as can be seen on this slide. These sections can be very neatly divided into three different groups as follows. So I've rearranged them into different classifications, different groups. The sections in the red are the equipment codes. They are section one, which is the power boilers. Section four, which is for the heating boilers. Section six is for care and operation of heating boilers. Section 7 is for care of the power boilers. Section 8 is pressure vessels. That's what we're going to be discussing today. Section 10 is for fiber reinforced plastic vessels. And section 12 is for transport vessels. The sections in the purple color are nuclear codes, and they include nuclear components and in-service inspection of nuclear components. The sections in the blue are the service codes. They include section two for materials, section five for non-destructive examination, and section nine for welding. These service codes are applicable to all the equipment codes as well as all the nuclear codes. We, of course, are interested in section eight, which actually is the code for pressure vessels and all the service codes that are applicable to the pressure vessels, which are the um, codes for, I mean, the sections for the materials, for non-destructive examinations, and for welding. These are the service codes that apply to all the pressure vessels. Section 8 for pressure vessels really consists of three different divisions, Division 1, Division 2, and Division 3. Most of the pressure vessels worldwide are built in Division 1. And the rest of this training will mainly focus on Division I pressure vessels. From this point on, when we say ASME code, we will refer to ASME Section 8, Division I. So the pressure vessels that are stamped with U symbol indicate that these vessels comply with the requirements of the ASME code, and they will operate safely through its design life. This training mostly is a review of the, most, of the main requirements of this code. Later in this training, we will use code formulas to design a simple pressure vessel. And we will also touch upon very briefly those aspects of pressure vessels that are not addressed by the code. The ASME code, and again by ASME code, I mean ASME Section 8, Division 1. ASME code has an introduction, three subsections A, B, and C, mandatory appendices and non-mandatory appendices. We are not going to be discussing the mandatory and non-mandatory appendices in this training. Suffice to say that if any of the features that are addressed in the mandatory appendices is used in the design of pressure vessel, bellows expansion joint, for example, then the requirements of that appendix for bellows expansion joint must be complied with. The requirements in non-mandatory appendices are usually suggestive. 
the engineer is not required to comply with the appendix EE, for example, even if half pipe is used in design. However, my advice is, why reinvent the wheel? If the design is provided in appendix EE for half pipe design, go ahead and use it. So let us look at the introduction first. This introduction consists of paragraph U1 through U5. U stands for unfired and is used throughout the ASME code. U1 provides the scope of the code and it reads as follows. This division contains mandatory requirements, specific prohibitions, and non-mandatory guidance for design and construction of pressure vessel. It also provides requirements for pressure vessel materials, design, fabrication, examination, inspection, testing, certification, and pressure relief. A word about pressure relief. ASME Code Committee has recognized the fact that manufacturer is not responsible for installing the pressure relief device. That is the responsibility of the user. So the pressure relief device must be located either directly on the pressure vessel itself or on a pipe which leads away from the pressure vessel with no intervening valve between the pressure relief device and the pressure vessel itself. In one of the earlier slides, we were wondering about the minimum and maximum pressure limits of the ASME code. The introduction provides guidance in this matter. It says ASME code is generally applicable for design pressures 15 PSI and above. Notice the word generally. Also, it says there is no upper limit for the design pressure. The formulas and the construction methods that are provided in this code, they are only good up until 3000 PSI. Above 3000 PSI, deviations from and additions to these formulas are used in the design. Provided we follow all safety requirements of the code, the pressure vessel can be stamped with division one stamp for pressures which are higher than 3000 PSI. Similarly, pressure vessels where pressures are lower than 15 PSI can also be designed in accordance with the ASME code. And they can be provided with the code stamp also, although there is no requirement in the code to do so. Industry practice is as follows. If the pressure range is between 0 and 2.5 PSI, the applicable code is API 650. If the pressure range is between 2.5 and 15 PSI, the applicable code is API 620. Remember that both API 650 and API 620, 20, the equipment is usually called a storage tank rather than a pressure vessel. If the pressure is between 15 PSI and 3000 PSI, then the applicable code is ASME Section 8 Division 1, which is what we are discussing in this training. If the pressure is between 3000 PSI and 10,000 PSI, ASME Section 8 Division 2 is the applicable code. And above 10,000 PSI, the applicable code is ASME Section 8 Division 3. Having said this, please realize that the ASME Section 8 Division 1 does not impose a higher limit. So if you had a pressure of 20,000 PSI, you could still design it using ASME Section 8 Division 1. But the general industry practice would be to use ASME Section 8 Division 3. The introduction also provides the scope of the code with respect to geometry. So as you can see in this slide, you have dashed lines on the right and left of the screen. To the right, of the dashed line and to the left of the dashed line, the code that applies is the piping code. So if you are in a process plant, the code that will apply will be ASME 31.3. Or if you are in a power plant, the code that will apply will be ASME 31.1. Everything inside of the two dashed lines is the scope of the ASME code. So for example, if you have a nozzle, which has got welded connection, then the scope will include the first circumferential weld. If you have a flange nozzle, which is also shown in this slide, the scope will include the first phase, of, or rather the phase of the first flange. Or if you have a threaded nozzle, the scope will include the first threaded portion of the nozzle. The scope also includes the manways or any kind of uh, uh, nozzle with a cover. Both nozzle and cover are going to be inside the scope of the ASME code. The pressure relief device is also going to be inside the scope of the code. 
As far as the responsibilities are concerned, the ASME code recognizes three parties, the user or designated agent, the manufacturer, and the inspector. The responsibilities of the user are not very clearly spelled out in Division 1. ASME Section 8 Division 2, on the other hand, requires the user to provide to the manufacturer a document called User Design Specification, or UDS, that will form the basis for manufacturer design. But there is no such requirement in ASME Section 8 Division 1. However, it is understood that the user will provide to manufacturer the overall size and design specifications upon which the manufacturer will base all the design on. The responsibilities for the manufacturer and the inspector are very clearly spelled out in the code. Now let us look at the subsection A that contains the general requirements, which is to say the requirements that apply irrespective of the method of fabrication and irrespective of the materials. The next two slides show the layout of subsection A, or rather the contents of the subsection A. All paragraphs in subsection A are numbered as UG, which stands for unfired general. The materials are addressed in paragraphs U. Let's go back a little. The scope is addressed in paragraph UG1. The materials are addressed in the paragraphs UG4 through UG15, and they include various product forms, whether it is pipe, plate, etc., and also the welding materials. Design is addressed in UG16 through UG35. We will look at the design in this training later on, and it will address design temperature and pressure, loadings, maximum allowable, stress values, shells, formed heads, flat heads, etc. Openings and reinforcements are addressed in paragraphs UG36 to UG46. And these will include openings, reinforcements, multiple openings, methods of attachment, nozzle necks, and inspection openings. We will look at the example of the nozzle reinforcement in this training later on also. The braced and state surfaces are addressed in UG47 through UG50, and they include braced and state surfaces and stables. Ligaments are addressed in UG53 through UG55 and include ligaments and supports. Fabrication is addressed in UG paragraphs UG75 through UG85. These include material identification, repairs, out of roundness, tolerances, choppy impact tests, and heat treatment. Inspection and tests are addressed in UG90 through UG103. And these include the responsibility of the inspector, maximum allowable working pressure, hydrostatic test, pneumatic test, and proof test. We will briefly discuss hydrostatic test and pneumatic test later on in this training. Markings and reports are addressed in paragraphs UG115 through UG120. And these will include markings on nameplates and data reports. Overpressure protection is addressed in UG125 through UG140 and they will include pressure relief valves, markings, certification, installation, and protection by system design. Now let us look at subsection B. This includes different methods of fabrication. The different methods of fabrication that is included in ASME Section 8 Division 1 is UW for welding, UF for forging, and UB for bracing. All the pressure vessels that we normally deal with will utilize welding as the method of fabrication. So in this training, we will only discuss from now on just this method of fabrication, which is welding. SME code talks about welded joint category and welded joint types. The welded joint category that is shown on this slide is purely dependent on where on the vessel is the joint located. There are four welded joint categories that are provided by ASME code section A division one. These are A, B, C, and D. The division two of the code also has a category E, but since we are discussing division one only here, we will stick with A, D, C, and D. The joint category A is all the longitudinal joints in the pressure vessel. 
If you look to the left of the slide, there is a vertical red line that you see. That red line, if you notice closely, the circumferential joint is also denoted as welded joint category A. That is only applicable if the head that is attached to the shell is a hemispherical head. As you can notice, all the joints in the hemispherical head are going to be category A. Category B is all the circumferential joint, including the circumferential joint which applies, which attaches a non-hemispherical head, which is to say two to one ellipsoidal head or a torospherical head or a flat head to the cylinder. So towards the right lower part of the screen, if you see there is a blue box, and that blue box shows the welded joint category B. And if you look closely, that refers to the circumferential joint which joins the uh, two to one ellipsoidal head in the nozzle to the cylinder. Welded joint category C refers to the joint between nozzle and the flange. And the welded joint category D refers to the joint between the nozzle and the cylinder. Well, the joint types, on the other hand, describe how the joint is made. Six different types are shown over here. The last three types, types four, five, and six, are very rarely used. Actually, there's another type, a corner joint, that is included in the ASME code, but I have not shown that over here. If you look at the joint type number two, there are two graphics that is shown on the screen. The second graphic of the joint type two is very common in vessels up to about 24 inch diameter where the straight flange of the head is offset a little bit. Here, the head can be pushed inside the cylinder because of this offset and the completed weld will be a type two of the offset type. The offset of the head in this case will act like a backing strip. As far as the integrity of the weld is concerned, the integrity is highest for type number one and it decreases as we go down the list. This slide shows the values for various joint efficiencies that will be used in the design formulas. So you can see different kinds of joints, one, two, three, four, five, and six. One, two, three is on the left of the screen, and four, five, six is towards the right of the screen. So as you can see, even after full radiography, for, for each of joint, you have been given the efficiencies for full radiography, spot radiography, and no radiography. So for example, for the type joint number one, if it is fully radiographed, the efficiency is one. If it is spot radiographed, the efficiency is 0.85. And if there is no um, X-ray uh, or rather radiographic examination at all, then the efficiency is 0 0.7. However, if you go down the list, down to the um, joint number two, even after full radiography, the efficiency is only 90%. So this is just to indicate to you the fact that even after the full radiography, it is not necessary that the efficiency is going to be 100%. We're not going to be discussing welded joint category and welded joint types any further in this training. But please keep in mind that in certain service conditions, lethal service, for example, they require that the welded joint be of a certain type. So what are those different service uh, types? These different service types which are provided in the code, they have certain welding restrictions. ASME code mentions four different services. I have only included three. As we mentioned in the previous slide, these services restrict the welded joints to be of a certain type. I'm not going to say what the certain types are, but I will highly recommend that you study part UW in the ASME code to learn more about these restrictions. So the three different types of, uh, of service restric restrictions that I have mentioned over here is number one, the lethal service. In For the pressure vessels which have lethal service, the butt wells shall be fully radiographed. That's the requirement number one. The second requirement is that once the pressure vessel has been fabricated, and if the pressure vessel is fabricated of carbon and low alloy steel, then the entire well shall be post well heat treated. The second service which restriction is for the vessels that operate below certain temperatures. And this is a very vague term. Certain temperatures, there is no number to it. So the um, 
the um, uh, certain temperatures will really depend on the material that is being used. Okay, and these will include restrictions on different types of wells. The third type of uh, um, the service restri restriction is for the unfired steam boilers. Uh, the for unfired steam boilers, you have to have full radiography for all the burnt wells, and after the steam boiler has been fabricated, the entire vessel must be post when heat treated. The service that I have not included here is the direct fired pressure vessel. Because such vessels are usually built to the requirements of section one, which is for the power boilers, and they are usually not built to the requirements of uh, section eight, division one. Radiography of wells is a very expensive operation, mainly because exposure to the X-rays is injurious to health. And therefore, the area where radiography is being performed has to be cordoned off completely. However, the benefits of radiographed wells show up as high joint efficiencies as was seen, seen in some of the previous slides. There are certain situations where full radiography is really not an option just to increase the joint efficiency and therefore to decrease the thickness that is required for the component. But it really is a code requirement. So what are those? Number one, if you have lethal service, as we have seen in the previous slide, then we need to have all the birth wells fully radiographed. It is not an option. It is a requirement of the code. The second one, if the nominal thickness at the welded joint is greater than one and a half inch, then again, that welded joint has to be fully radiographed. Point over here is, what is the definition of nominal thickness? Let us say that you are joining two different plates. One plate is one and a half inch. The second plate is one inch thick. So the nominal thickness in this case will be the smaller of two thicknesses, which will be one inch. So the nominal thickness of this welded joint is going to be one inch, not one and a half inch. I have included this particular bullet point number two in red font because the one and a half inch thickness is not really carved in stone. Depending on which material we are using, that number can be lower than one and a half inch. And we will see that later in the training where that will apply. The third place where full radiography is required is in unfired steam boilers where design pressure is greater than 50 PSI. The fourth is going to be nozzles where nominal thickness at welded joint is going to be greater than one and a half inch. So this is really very closely related to bullet point number two. The fifth place where fully radiograph, uh, full radiography is required is if the nozzles are attached to shells and heads which themselves require full radiography. However, in this case, if the nozzles do not exceed NPS 10 or 1.125 inches wall thickness, then those nozzles are excluded. Those nozzles, or rather the butt wells in those nozzles in those cases, do not need to be fully radiographed. Sometimes you may not want to do radiography for the entire length of the well, which means that you don't want to fully radiograph the well. You can do spot radiography. You can still get the improvement in joint efficiency, but not to the same extent as full radiography. So what is spot radiography? Spot radiography, it does not ensure predetermined quality level throughout because you are not really doing the radiography for the entire length of the well. It requires that one spot must be examined for every 50 feet increment of the well. You are not doing the radiograph for the entire 50 feet, just one spot is what you're radiographing. For each increment of the weld, a sufficient number of spots must be taken to examine welding of each welder. So for example, if you have a 50 foot increment, although the second bullet point says that you, can, you, you, you may select just one spot, but if there are two welders who have done the welding for that 50 foot increment, then you should select two spots, one for each welder. The location of the spots that are chosen then must be done by the authorized inspector, the AI, and he should do this after completion of the increment of the well that has to be examined. The minimum length of the spot radiography is six inches. So once the spot radiography is done, 
the film which contains the radiograph must be evaluated for acceptability. If the spot radiograph is acceptable, then the entire well implement is, is considered to be acceptable. However, if the spot radiograph is not acceptable, then two additional spots away from the original spot must be selected by your authorized inspector and must be examined again. If the two additional spot radiographs are now acceptable, then the entire well increment is, is acceptable. However, if either of two additional spots is not acceptable, then the entire well increment is rejected. So if the well is rejected, then what do you do? You really have two options then. Option number one, you continue inspecting the entire well length, 50 foot or whatever the length is, and then repair those portions which do not pass the evaluation. Once all the repair has been made, then the welder can opt either for full radiography or for spot radiography. The option number two is that after the weld has been rejected, you tear open the entire weld seam, re-weld, and you repeat the process again. So where do we get the procedure to do the radiography? That comes from ASME section five for NDE or non-destructive examinations. This is one of the three service codes and is used by all the equipment codes and the nuclear codes. It consists of different articles. I have not shown all the articles over here, but I will read out the articles that I have because these are usually used in the fabrication of pressure vessels. Article 1 is for general requirements. Article 2 is for radiographic examination. Articles 4 and 5 are for ultrasonic examination. Article 6 is for liquid penetrant examination. Article 7 is for magnetic particle examination. Article 8 is, is for eddy current examination. Article 9 is for visual examination. Article 10 is for leak testing. And articles 12 and 13 are for acoustic emission examination. In any case, ASME Section 5 does not provide the acceptance criteria. It only provides the procedure to do the examination. The acceptance criteria is provided by the equipment codes. In our case, the, it is provided by Section 8, Division 1. Similarly, for welding, Part UW of ASME Section 8, Division 1 provides requirements with respect to types of wells. However, the actual welding processes, the qualification of welding procedures, and the testing of welders and welding operators, those are provided in ASME Section 9, which is the second of the three service codes. Like other service codes, the welding part of Section 9 is used by all the equipment codes when welding is used. Remember, ASME Section 9 is not just for welding. It is for welding, for brazing, and for forging. Now, let us look at subsection C. It deals with materials. Subsection C consists of 11 different parts. They are shown in this slide. This part, you see, yes. UNF, UHA, UCI, UCL, UCD, UHT, ULW, ULT, UHX, and UIG. Of this part, UHX, is, it does not really deal with the material. It addresses the design requirements of tube sheets, of shells, and of, of shell and tube heat exchangers. So why do we have this in subsection C? It really does not belong here. But perhaps the ASMA committee members could not find a suitable place to put this. And most likely, this part UHX will find home somewhere else in the future and not in subsection C. By far, the most common material that is used, or rather the types of material that is used in pressure vessel construction, is carbon steel. And therefore, we will just concentrate on part UCS for this training purposes, which deals with carbon and low alloy steel. Every part in subsection C, including part UCS, has a table that lists all the material specifications for that material type that can be used in construction of the pressure vessel. Use of material which is not there in these tables is not permitted by the code. So for part UCS, this table is table UCS 23. It lists all the materials. You can see them on this slide over here. I'm not going to read all these materials, and I'm going to concentrate just on one of those materials. The material that I'm going to concentrate in part UCS construction is SA516. 
SA-516 comes in four different grades, 55, 60, 65, and 70. These numbers represent the minimum tensile strength that the material must have. That is, grade 70 must have a tensile strength of minimum 70,000 PSI. The most commonly used grade for SA-516 in pressure vessel construction nowadays is grade 70. This is what we'll be using in our example problem. So where do we find the properties for this material? For that, we have to turn to the last of the service codes, which is ASME section 2. ASME section 2 has four different parts, part A, B, C, and D. We are only interested for the purposes of this training on part D, as in delta, as part D contains the information we need to design the pressure vessel. Section 2, part D has got three different subparts. Subpart 1, which is for the stress tables. Subpart 2, which is for physical properties table. And subpart 3, which is for external pressure charts and external pressure tables. It also has mandatory appendices and non-mandatory appendices. We're not going to bother with mandatory appendices and non-mandatory appendices for this training. We generally use subpart 1 and subpart 3 for our design processes. Because if we have the internal pressure, then we use subpart 1. And if we have the external pressure, then in addition to subpart 1, we'll be using subpart 3. For the purposes of this training, we will not consider the external pressure, so we'll be using subpart 1 only. The Stress tables, uh, tables that are applicable to the materials which are permitted by ASME Section A Division 1 are as follows. Table 1A contains the allowable stresses for the ferrous materials. Table 1B has the allowable stresses for non-ferrous materials. And Table 3 has the allowable stresses for the bolting materials. As far as the ASME is concerned, the definition of ferrous materials and non-ferrous materials is as follows. If the material contains, or rather the iron content of the material is 50% or more, then it is considered a part, it is considered a ferrous material. If it is going to be, if iron is going to be less than 50% of the material, then it is considered a non-ferrous material. What follows in this slide and the next slide, is the information that is provided for each and every material specification in Table 1A. Shown here is the information of for SA-516 in grade 70. This is what we'll be using in our example problem. This information is spread over four different pages. Page 20, 20 21, 22, and 23. For each of those pages, I have shown just the information for 516 grade 70. The actual code has got on each and every page a whole bunch of other materials also. So on page 20, as you can see, the information for SA-516 grade 70 is shown in line number 33. So when we go to the next three pages, we have to look for line number 33 to get the information of SA-516 grade 70. That's why the line number is repeated on all the pages. So for on page 20, we have the information about the nominal composition. We have the information about the product form. This SA516 grade 70 is a plate. We have the spec number. We have the type grade, which is 70. We have the UNS alloy number, which is K02700. Class condition temper. There is nothing given for SA516 grade 70. There is no restriction on size thickness. P number for SA516 is one, and group number for SA516 is two. This is usually used in the welding requirements. And we'll look at why this P number and group number is important in a later slide. Page number 21 includes information for minimum tensile strength. It is given in KSI, kilo uh, PSI. So 70 is actually 70,000 PSI. Similarly, the minimum yield strength is 38,000 PSI. It also provides the maximum temperature limits for all the codes that are represented in table 1A. So if you are dealing with section one, the maximum temperature is 850 degree Fahrenheit. Section three, which is for the nuclear code, the maximum temperature is 700 degree Fahrenheit. For our 
purposes, Section 8, Division 1, the maximum temperature that can be used for SA 516 grade 70 is 1000 degree Fahrenheit. And for Section 12, the maximum temperature is 650 degree Fahrenheit. The next column is the external pressure chart. If the pressure vessel that is constructed out of SA 516 grade 70 is exposed to vacuum, therefore exposed to external pressure, then you need to uh, refer to chart number CS2 to do the design calculations for the external pressure. The nodes in the last column uh, are the nodes that are applicable to um, SA 516 grade 70. So you need to look up the node number G10, S1, and T2 to find out the information. Next two pages provide the maximum allowable stresses for SA 516 grade 70 at different temperatures. So as you can see, the uh, temp as the temperature increases, the allowable stress, it holds steady up until about 500, 500 degree Fahrenheit, and then it starts to drop off, first slowly and then rapidly. So uh, it, at uh, 600 degrees, it falls to 19,400, 18,800 at 650. But you look at what happens at 750. It goes from 18,100 18, to 14,800, then to 12,000, then to 9,300, 6,700. It drops up very rapidly. Note that the allowable stress at 400 degree Fahrenheit is highlighted. It is only highlighted because the example problem that we will do is for 400 degree Fahrenheit. So we will use a allowable stress of 20,000 psi. Also note that the allowable stresses highlighted in pink start from 750 degree Fahrenheit. And these are also italicized font. And they indicate that these are time dependent values. So what does time dependent value mean? It means that here in this temperature range, the, the um, material SA560 is behaving in a creep range. I'm not going to discuss what the creep range is. I uh, will advise that after this training is over, you go and look up what uh, uh, treat behavior, beha behavior of the material is. Finally, note that the maximum temperature for which the allowable stress is given for SA 516 is 11, is 1000 degree Fahrenheit. And this is the temperature that was applicable to section eight division one, which we saw in the previous slide. Now let us go back to part UCS again. So you see, there's a table UCS 57, which lists thicknesses above which full, full radiography is required. So for P number one, group one, which is which 516 is a part of, this thickness is one and a quarter inch. If you remember, this is more restrictive than that was indicated in part UG, which was one and a half inch. The last thing that I wanted to discuss, but not in any detail, is low temperature operation. This is discussed in part UCS 65 through part UCS 68. Low temperature operation becomes an issue only for carbon steel as it has a tendency to transition from ductile material into brittle material at low temperatures. We want to work only with ductile materials in pressure vessels. We want to avoid temperatures where the material, material transitions into brittle behavior. Stainless steel and non-ferrous alloys, they display ductile, ductile behavior even at very low temperatures. And usually we don't need to worry about low temperature operation for these materials. So now let's take an example vessel. Here we have a vessel, a really a column, which is about 60 inches diameter, inside diameter. The length of the shell is about 360 inches. The top head is two to one ellipsoidal head. The bottom head is a hemispherical head. We have a 16 inch nozzle in the shell and the pressure vessel is supported by a skirt and the length of the skirt from the uh, end of the shell to the base plate is about 60 inches. We have provided the design conditions. The design temperature is 150 PSI, design temperature is 400 degree Fahrenheit, the material of construction is SA516 grade 70. And we are required to calculate shell thickness, head thickness, nozzle thickness, and nozzle reinforcement. These are the normal calculation which any pressure vessel engineer will have to do. We are going to assume that the design pressure is uniform, 150 PSI over the entire column. In reality, that is not the case. In reality, there will be a liquid level. And above the liquid level, there will be a vapor pressure equal to 150 PSI. 
but below the liquid level, the pressure due to static head will must be added to the design pressure. So if, if you have water, for example, the static head is about 0 0.4 PSI for every foot or 9.81 kilopascal for every meter. In our example, for example, if the liquid level were at top of the shell, then the design pressure at the bottom of the shell will be 150 PSI plus 360 divided by 12, because this has to be uh, in feet, multiplied by 0 0.4 for a total of 162 PSI. This is assuming that the fluid is water. But for our example, we'll ignore the static head. So let us look at calculations for the shell first. This is based on the formula for circumferential stress. Every shell, when it is exposed to design for, for any kind of pressure load, will be developing the circumferential load, which will act on the longitudinal joint, and the longitudinal stress, which will act on the circumferential joint. Circumferential stress, which acts on the longitudinal joint, is nearly twice as large as the longitudinal stress and it results in increased thickness. So for this reason, we have not looked at the longitudinal stress because it does not really govern in this case. The longitudinal stress, for example, in this case is going to be one half of, or rather the thickness required because of the longitudinal stress would be one half of the thickness required over here. So what is the formula? The formula for circumferential stress, we also call them hoop stress, uh, by the way. Um, if the, the thickness uh, uh, formula is PR divided by SE minus 0.6P, the pressure is 150 PSI, radius of the shell is 30 inches, S is the allowable stress, which we have seen previously at 400 degree Fahrenheit is 20,000 PSI. For the purposes of this example, we will assume that the efficiency is 100%, so it will be 1.0. So the thickness that is required is going to be 0 0.226 inches, and we will choose a commercial thickness of 0.25 inches. One other thing to keep in mind, of all the loads that act on the pressure vessel, only the pressure load results in a circumferential stress. All the other loads, the wind load, the seismic load, dead load, etc., they all result in longitudinal stress only. So if all these other loads are significant, and it is possible that the combined longitudinal stress may become larger than the circumferential stress. So in that case, we will have to consider the longitudinal stress also. Let us look at now the, the thickness for the ellipsoidal head. When we calculate the thickness for the ellipsoidal head, we have to calculate what is known as L. L stands for uh, spherical radius. L is the inside spherical radius or crown radius. The values are given in this table. They are dependent on the value of D divided by 2H. D divided by 2H for 2 to 1 ellipsoidal head, where the ratio of the major axis to minor axis is 2.0, is 0 0.9. Uh, rather, the value, the, the factor K1 is 0 0.9. And you can use this factor 0 0.9 to come up with spherical radius. So the spherical radius, if you look at the box on the right-hand side, for Two to one ellipsoidal head with the inside diameter of 60 inches, the spherical radius is going to be 60 times 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is the K1 factor. So the spherical radius is going to be 54 inches. This is what we're going to be using to come up with the thickness, required thickness for the ellipsoidal head. So let us look at the formula. Um, well, there's one other thing to keep in mind. We did look up the value of uh, the spherical radius for 2 to 1 ellipsoidal head. But in really, um, the ellipse does not really have a single spherical radius. The spherical radius keeps on changing uh, along the contour of the, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of the ellipsoidal head. However, a perfect 2 to 1 ellipsoidal head is simply not possible to be fabricated. Therefore, we approximate a 2 to 1 ellipsoidal head by using a center dish radius of 90% of the ID, which is 54 inches in our case, as the ID is 60 inches, and a knuckle radius, which is equal to 17% of the ID. The code formula for 2 to 1 ellipsoidal head, which is given in the code, is based on this approximation. So once the thickness is calculated, so I mean, before we do that, before we get to that point, let's calculate the thickness. So the thickness is given by this equation PD divided by 2 SE minus 0.2P, and you do the calculation, you come out to be, the required thickness is 0 0.225 inches, 
and we use a commercial thickness of 0.25 inches. Once we calculate the thickness, we need to go back and check for the condition which is given right on the top where T by L is greater than or equal to 0.002. In our case, the T by T divided by L is 0.0046. So this condition is satisfied. The other thing to note over here is that the thickness of the ellipsoidal head, rather the required thickness of the ellipsoidal head, is almost exactly the same as the thickness of the shell. This is always going to be true. For this reason, in the process industry at least, the pressure vessel heads are generally of two to one ellipsoidal construction. This way, there is no discontinuity between the shell and the head. Next, let's, uh, let's look at the hemispherical head. The equation for calculating the thickness for the hemispherical head is PL divided by 2 SC minus 0.2 P, and the required thickness comes out to 0.113. Now, thing to be noted over here, the required thickness for the hemispherical head is going to be one half of the required thickness for the shell. This, again, is always going to be true. And just like we did for the ellipsoidal head, here also we need to take this thickness and check for the uh, condition that thickness is less than or equal to 0.356L and to make sure that that condition is satisfied. In our example, we don't have a flat head. But nonetheless, I have wanted to show you uh, what the calculation was to get the thickness of the unstayed flat head. The calculation really depends on configuration of the flat cover. One of the easiest and most popular configuration is configuration number F of figure UG34, which is shown here in the red box. Here, a thick round disc of metal with an OD that can slide inside the cylinder and then double fillet welded is shown. For this configuration, the formula is shown on the next slide. But one thing to note over, over here is that for this particular configuration, the value of C is 0.33. So using that value of C, we can calculate the required thickness of a flat head given by the formula, as you can see on the screen over here. And that thickness is 2.985 inches, which is very high compared to thickness of the shell and the head. The thickness of the nozzle can also be calculated the same way as the thickness of the shell. And uh, the, so if you see the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, equation is the same. Um, and if we use a standard scheduled pipe for 16 inches, uh, the, I, uh, the ID of the uh, pipe is going to be 15.25 inches. Therefore, R is going to be whatever 15.25 divided by 2 is. You calculate the thickness, it comes out to 0.115. And the actual thickness that you are using is 0.375 because that is the thickness of the standard schedule pipe for 16 inch. And so we are okay over here. We also need to check uh, for the flange. If you use an ANSI flange, you don't need to do the ASME calculations. But you do need to check the flange rating to make sure that this flange is suitable for, this, for the design condition. So in our case, the design temperature is 400 degree Fahrenheit. At 400 degree Fahrenheit, a 150-pound flange is good up until 200 psi. Our design pressure is only 150 psi, so we are fine. So we can we can accept this flange. We can also look. The next thing we need to do is look at the nozzle reinforcement. Now, because some of the material has been removed from the uh, shell, uh, therefore the material becomes weak, and at the periphery of the opening, there are going to be very high discontinuity stresses. So the, uh, these discontinuity stresses are um, going to be high at the periphery of the nozzle, but they're going to reduce, and they're going to reduce to whatever the uh, normal stress in the, uh, in the shell is going to be. And by the time it goes from the periphery, high stresses at the periphery to the normal um, uh, stress at the, uh, away from the periphery, that distance is about one diameter from center of the opening. So the ASME, what it does is it employs the theory of area replacement to reinforce the nozzle. So in our problem, the area that has been removed is one quarter inch thick, and it is 15.25 inches diameter. The actual area equation is given in this slide. In this slide, we have two different, uh, um, on the right-hand side, you have two different terms. One is DTR multiplied by F, and the second term includes a factor called FR1. If the reinforcing material and the material of the shell is same, then FR1 is equal to zero. 
uh, or rather FR1 will be equal to one and therefore the second term will disappear. So once that happens, then now we are left with just one term, DTRF, and the value of F usually varies from 0 0.5 to one. So if we are conservative, we assume that F is equal to one. Therefore the area that has to be replaced is just DTR and TR is 0 0.25, diameter is 15.25. So as you can see, the area that has to be replaced is 3.82 square inches. Now that area needs to be, the, re, re, the reinforcement plate needs to be uh, provided within this um, outside diameter, which is going to be one diameter away from center of the nozzle as is shown on the screen. Okay. The actual um, requirement is shown in UG37. And th this is the graphic that is um, taken from the code. As you can see in the red box over here, that is the replacement. Um, um, uh, that is the reinforcement plate. There are other requirements as well, which uh, go into the, um, the actual calculations, but we're not going to bother with those for this particular training. Uh, there are other factors also that go into the calculations, uh, which we have not uh, considered over here. For example, if there is, uh, if the pressure vessel is subjected to vacuum, we have external pressure, then the requirements of UD28 to 30 will appear. If you have wind loading or seismic loading, then the requirements of ASCE7 will apply. ASCE stands for American Society of Civil Engineers. If you have nozzle loading, then the requirements uh, of WRC Bulletin 537 will apply. Obviously, the pressure vessel has, has to have support. In this case, in our case, the support was a, a skirt support. Uh, if you have a saddle support, then the uh, design is given by a paper by LPZ. For other kinds of support, there is no industry standard. So um, whatever is acceptable to the authorized inspector can be used. The, all the pressure vessels must be pressure tested after fabrication is complete. The testing can be done either by hydro test or it can be done by pneumatic test. Hydro test is given in UG99 and the pneumatic test is given in the uh, requirements for pneumatic test is given in uh, UG100. The pressure vessels are also uh, going to have uh, certain inspection openings. This slide over here gives you the requirement for all the inspection openings. They're also required to have certain markings. And this slide and the next few slides will give you the requirements for different markings. By the way, the requirements are given in paragraphs UG115 to UG120. The most important of the, the markings, obviously, are the ASME marking itself and the marking U if the pressure vessel has been constructed to meet the requirements for U. There are other symbols also that can be used. In addition, there has the name of the manufacturer should also be mentioned and it should be preceded by the word certified by. So it will say certified by ABC Incorporated or some such thing. There are other markings, if there are, uh, um, if, if, the, if the welding has been used, then the letter W will apply. Uh, if it is done by pressure welding, except by resistance, then the letter T will apply. Brazing, B will apply. Resistance welding, R, E, S will apply. Uh, for special services, lethal service, L marking will be there. For unfired steam boiler, UB marking will be there. And direct firing, the DF marking will be there. And then there is going to be RT1, RT2, RT3, RT4, depending on the extent of uh, the radiography examination that is done on the pressure vessels. And the last thing is going to be the maximum allowable working pressure at different temperature, external working pressure, the design middle temperature, the manufacturer serial number, and the year that is paid. And the data reports also are going to be included. So the various kind of data reports are U1, U1A, U2, U3, and U4. So depending on which one is going to be applicable, that data report is going to be supplied with the pressure vessel. So this brings us, brings us to the end of today's training. The objective of this training was to just give you an introduction to ASME code and a very basic understanding of the very basic design of the pressure vessel. If you want to gain more expertise, I would advise that you look at books, you look at internet articles. There are a whole bunch of YouTube videos that are also available. You can use those resources 
for the self-study. If you like a more structured um, format, then uh, I provide a four-day live online training on the weekends. So the next one that I'll be providing will be on June 13 and 14 and on June 20 and 21. Live trainings usually must be set for a time zone. So this particular training will be for benefit of engineers in the Indian subcontinent. If there is sufficient interest, then I will offer similar trainings in the other time zones as well. You will also receive, I believe, a PDF copy of this presentation. You will also uh, receive a digital certificate that will be mailed to the email addresses that were provided during registration. If you are from the North American subcontinent, then you will also be eligible for one credit hour of professional development towards maintenance of your PE license. So you can keep the certificate that is provided as a proof in case you are uh, audited. Again, if you have any questions uh, regarding this particular presentation or anything else with respect to pressure vessels, you can always contact me. You have uh, my email ID and you have also my LinkedIn ID. Uh, that uh, you can follow if you have a LinkedIn profile yourself. Okay, all right. So that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, goodbye and namaste and have a good day.